China has entered a structural economic slowdown. The official growth rate last year, 2023, was 5.2%, but my colleagues at, at Rhodium Group uh, believe it was closer to 1.5%. China wants to be an economic superpower, but if there is a conflict in Taiwan, if there is a conflict in the South China Sea, I mean, you know, the Chinese consumers are not going to go back to the supermarket. The 2004, 2014, and Latin America is called the golden decade, pretty much driven by China. Just as this century, we have seen that China is the number one buyer for South American commodities. They are clearly positioned as the dominating power on EVs, and that is not going to change. North Korea is now a big supplier for Russia in terms of uh, ammunition. So they will activate the North uh, Korean card, and at the same time we will see military tensions below the threshold of a kinetic warfare with neighbors of China in South China Sea and obviously in the Strait of Taiwan. The policy environment in, in China, which has become much more focused on security, uh, and less on economic growth under Xi Jinping. So there are a number of reasons why, the, why China has become a less attractive market for foreign investors. China is all often accusing others to politicizing things when the Communist Party of China is actually the most political entity you can find anywhere in the world. The war of Russia against Ukraine is going to continue at least up until Three 2025 to 2026. Yeah. You're going to observe more and more bifurcation within Europe. So Cold War yeah. 2.0, Dragon Bear on the one side, United States on the other, and for the European powers it will be increasingly difficult to position in between by not taking sides. Namaste Jai Hind, you're watching or listening to another edition of the ANI podcast with Smita Prakash. This episode is being filmed in New Delhi on the sidelines of the Raisina Dialogue 2024. The Raisina Dialogue is India's premier multilateral conference which brings in thought leaders, politicians and diplomats from around the world to ideate. The topic for discussion today is China. The Chinese New Year has begun, the Year of the Dragon. In Chinese mythology, the dragon has long been associated with prosperity and imperial power. So is this the year that the Chinese economy surges ahead of the European Union and the United States? Let's ask the panel. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Valina, to be part of this podcast. Um, I'm looking forward to discussing China, the flavor of the season. <laughs> so uh, let me begin with Noah. Um, the prospect of Chinese economy for 2024, does it inspire the same confidence in investors this year as it did uh, in pre-COVID years and just after COVID? I don't think it does. Uh, I, I think China has entered a, a structural economic slowdown. Um, the official growth rate last year, 2023, was 5.2%. Um, but we, my colleagues at, at Rhodium Group uh, believe it was closer to 1.5%. And we could, see, uh, we could see a bit of a jump this year uh, because the property sector, which has been going through a crisis for a number of years now, uh, uh, may start to bottom out. Um, but the Chinese economy is entering a period of structural slowdown, uh, and I think we'll, we should be expecting growth rates in the low single digits rather than the high single digits that we had pre-COVID. And uh, the population, uh, the negative growth of population, the impact on the economy there? That's well, what the population has begun shrinking. Uh, I think uh, this won't have a major economic impact immediately. I think it's, if you look out, 5, 10, 15 years, it will start having a bigger impact uh, as the years go so by. You don't see that impacting on production? and Well, it's certainly not positive uh, yeah. when, when your population is shrinking. Um, but I think uh, what we're going to see uh, in terms of population shrinkage and impact on the economy, uh, I, I think the, the biggest impact will be uh, further down the line, a decade from now and, 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 and beyond that. And rising costs of things like aging population, uh, all that, uh, and, you know, women not wanting to uh, bear children, so that means all those issues would also come up, right, when you're making the yeah. uh, planning for investing in China, these will sure. come up? I mean, there are many reasons why China has become uh, 
a more difficult market for foreign investors. Um, you mentioned the demographic issues and aging population. Uh, there are also the geopolitical issues that yes. we're all familiar with. Um, uh, U.S. Uh, export controls and uh, uh, attempts to restrict uh, uh, exports and investments in critical technologies, especially semiconductors. Um, but there are other reasons as well, uh, including uh, the policy environment in, in China, which has become much more focused on security uh, and less on economic growth under Xi Jinping. Um, so there are, there, are, there are a number of reasons why, the, why China has become a less attractive market for foreign investors. That doesn't, it's still the second biggest economy in the world. It doesn't mean that uh, uh, investors are going to suddenly divest and, mm -hmm. and, and, and leave the market, but uh, diversification is already underway. And, uh, but this will be a slow process, uh, and uh, we may not see the full impact of that uh, or, or see that in the, in the foreign direct investment figures for, for a number of years. Uh, I'll move on to the uh, former president of Bolivia. Um, uh, and pardon me, I'm going to be calling you by first name if that's yes, okay. Yes, please. Yes, please. So I believe uh, an earlier session, uh, you set it on fire with your comments. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to it. I, I need the numbers for the podcast. Uh -huh. So, uh, Ori, I'm going to come to you and ask you this. Um, China and Russia investing in the lithium projects in Bolivia. Uh -huh. That is what everybody is talking about. And uh, the close economic ties that Latin American countries are having with China. That's got people in Washington, D.C. worried. It's got mm. people in Europe uh, raising their eyebrows. Which way is it going, China expanding its footprint in uh, South America? Well, Smith, it's been a long time coming. Actually, it's been lasting almost as long as this century. The 2004, 2014, and Latin America is called the golden decade pretty much driven by China buying ever increasing volumes at ever higher prices of what we make not in Latin America, but South America. South of the Panama Canal, uh, we're probably more Chinese, Central American, Caribbean, still under the influence of the US. But in South America, we've been endowed with uh, food, uh, energy, and minerals. And that's what China has been buying. Whether it's grains, wheat, soybeans from Argentina and Brazil, whether it's zinc, tin, copper, lead, from Peru, Chile, Bolivia, or oil from Venezuela, or coal from Colombia. That's, they've been buying that uh, at a very rapid uh, rate and has, has grown a lot. Yes, certainly it, it is of concern, as Noah was mentioning. It seems like China is slowing down, although I would submit, you know, I don't want to dispute the numbers, if they're growing, if they cooled off to a 5% growth rate, that is a high fever for many economies in today's situation in Latin America. It's still, a, yeah, the, the the sky-high growth rates where they were growing at 10, 12 percent seem to be behind us. I will tell you that in South America, we have not yet felt the slowdown, perhaps attributable to the fact of because of the skirmishes and uh, the invasion, the brutal invasion of Russia and Ukraine and the skirmishes on the sea, uh, the prices of energy are still holding up. And that's what um, matters. The prices of food are still holding up. Maybe minerals, they're, they're going down uh, a bit. Uh, and I think what you mentioned is also very important coming up ahead. Uh, China, you know, Russia has made announcements on China and my country. Unfortunately, all the lithium is underground. Yes, long term is very important. 60% of the world's lithium reserves, depending on what study you believe, are in a triangle in South America between Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. And lithium batteries are being completely dominated by China. Uh, just as this century we have seen that China is the number one buyer for South American commodities, they are clearly positioned as the dominating power on EVs, and that is not gonna change. If you drive around, when you're driving around Delhi, you hear the noise, you see the motorcycles making noise, the cars making noise. When you drive in Hangzhou, Guangzhou, Beijing, Shanghai, it's all quiet. A lot of lithium batteries, green license plates, everything on two and three wheels is with EVs. And to make a lithium battery, you need, it's like a tennis match, you need on one side, one racket with cobalt, nickel, manganese, the other side graphite, and the lithium is the balls that go back and forth. Everything that I just mentioned, China is refining between 60 plus percent to 90 plus percent of everything that goes into a lithium battery. And whether that becomes iron phosphate or sodium later, they're still dominating. 
So chances are the relation is relationship is going to be even stronger. And Noah was mentioning trade restrictions. Yeah, they are. But you make the rules, and here comes the workaround. Uh, you will see an onslaught of investment of Chinese BYDs, Xpeng, Neon, Cartel, the, the, the EV, going to Mexico, taking advantage of the free trade uh, with Americans. So now we'll see what the reaction is, because they're supposed to have a free trade agreement with Mexico, and German manufacturers are there, and French manufacturers are there, and will there be an exception for China? We'll see. Uh, but in, in a nutshell, yes, China certainly is slowing down. We have not yet felt it in what we sell, energy, food, and minerals, and in lithium, it is very positive that China is uh, speeding up the adoption of EVs, but it's also worrisome that one country can be the sole buyer of the lithium that we make up ahead. So I hope uh, India, that has more people now, gets going, gets the EV adoption, uh, and gets uh, its transformation underway on the new clean economy as well. Is that a topic of conversation among uh, policymakers in your country about this dependence on one country buying and processing it? Uh, I, I would tell you probably not to the detail because it's surprising up until The Economist came out with the cover of the Chinese EVs raining down on the world. It, it took me a while to try to explain to people uh, in my part of the world that, you know, because they think lithium batteries, they think Tesla. Uh, mm -hmm. And here, Mr. Free Market Elon Musk is just asking for tariffs on Chinese cars because the onslaught is coming. So, they, you know, they, we still, we haven't adopted them domestically. So they think of Tesla and Elon Musk and they don't realize that, you know, BYD sold more EVs last quarter or last year, mm -hmm. EVs, not hybrids, not gas fire, than Tesla. And that change is going to keep coming. And if you drive around China, you see the dramatic transformation, whatever you may think. And I'm the last thing, the last person you'll be confused with a communist, but you have to admit and recognize the effectiveness on the delivery when the China state decides to change the cars to EVs with the green license plates and uh, less contamination and less noise. They are uh, delivering on, on that. So it's certainly something very dramatic that I will tell you in my part of the world is still not yet being discussed and the domination of China in this sector, which should be of long-term concern, is not yet on, on the discussion. And that's why I, I like being at the Ricina Forum, because the only alternative in terms of dramatic adoption of EV mobility, not just on cell phones and the watches and the iPods and the iPads, but on the, on the cars and the motorcycles and the, tri and the tricycles you know, or the three-wheel uh, vehicles is, is India. So I hope uh, India gets going. I hope India starts making the lithium batteries because I think I see India as the only potential true long-term competitor because yes, China may be uh, a little less people than you have, uh, two and a half times the economy, but you're a lot younger. So all those young Indians are going to be buying the motorcycles and the cars in the future, hopefully with lithium batteries, hopefully with lithium from South America. But it will take time, right? That, that's yes. going to take time. Yes, it will take time, but I can tell you the beginning of the century, here we are, uh, nobody saw the China uh, coming. Uh, yeah. And China traveled around South America. Uh, it's Hu Jintao, Jiang Zemin saying, oh, please give me the WTO market recognition. I said, why are they wasting their time? Hmm. Well, now we know. It was a long-term thing. Like, for example, if India was to sign a free trade agreement with South America today, people would go, why? What is there in, in, in common or what convergence is there between South America and India? Let me tell you, perhaps you ought to take a page from China. If you build it, they will come, as the movie says. If you, if you develop the free trade agreement, then your great population and your need for energy and food and minerals from South America and Africa will only, um, uh, those links will only be enhanced and improved if you develop a trade framework ahead of time as opposed to lagging later. Let me come to you, Philippe, uh, before I come to Evelina. Um, Philippe, we were talking about expansion of Chinese interests in Latin America, um, the creeping influence of China, slowly, steadily, and then taking it all over, you know. Um, so is Beijing's footprint in the world, especially in um, Latin America and Russia, uh, is it going to increase or decrease in the coming years, seeing that their economy is shrinking a bit compared to the earlier years? 
Yes, well, let me first say, I mean, I don't dispute anything you know, has been, which has been said already, but uh, the Chinese economy is not in the best of shapes. Um, I mean, I lived in China in the 1990s. I mean, uh, the, the growth rate was like 15%, you know, uh, per annum. Um, you know, companies were booming, factories everywhere. The, uh, the, sorry to interrupt. This was before the one-child norm. Well, the one China norm actually started a uh, long time ago, uh, but it stopped. Stop. Um, okay. So that's yeah. a separate issue. Okay. Uh, that Sorry. basically was a mistake. Yeah. But anyway, that's <laughs> that's over now. They're trying to have more more than two if possible, which is not working. Anyway, um, the um, the problem is, you know, Xi Jinping, the, the current leader of China, set a goal of uh, becoming a, he called it a, a mid-level uh, economy. Uh, that means one of the... Um, poorest of the richest countries, if you want, by uh, 2027. 20, uh, and to do this, you need to um, free the economy, you need, uh, you need um, 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 birth, <laughs> uh, you need um, all kinds of activities. You need foreign direct investments, which is the lowest FDI record yeah. in, in 20 years this year, $33 billion, I believe. Yeah. So, you know, on, on this level, and, and I think Noah mentioned the, uh, the real estate situation, which is really bad. I mean, some companies are going bankrupt. Um, they are cutting interest rates to try to uh, create some, um, um, you know, more uh, consumption, which is a big problem uh, compared to other economies, uh, including the U.S. So, you know, at the same time, you do have this uh, nationalistic goal to uh, go around the world, which was um, symbolized perhaps by the Belt and Road Initiative, which is still going on. Uh, we had a forum in Beijing a few months ago. But for some reason, the message has been um, damaged by the uh, domestic situation in China. And also, there is, you know, a case for, you know, the, the three years of pandemic, the uh, the war with uh, the the war in Ukraine, where China has not really condemned Russia. Far from that. Uh, all of this is contributing to um, a, a worsening image for for China in the eyes of foreign uh, investors, multinationals, even in the eyes of some Chinese who've been. Uh, questioning this um, rule of the past uh, 10 years, which is completely different from the situation I knew myself when I lived there for 11 years. Right. Uh, Belina, let me come to you uh, to move away from the numbers game. Uh, on the sidelines of the Munich conference, uh, the Indian foreign minister, external affairs minister, he said uh, India does not expect Europe to have New Delhi's view uh, of China just as India does not have Europe's view of Russia. We were just talking about Putin, so that an, and you are in Europe, so that's why I'm coming to that. Uh, he also said, let's accept that there are natural differences in relationships. So now, um, resurging Russia, uh, China uh, playing a larger role despite its economy, uh, not doing all that great, is, it, is there some understanding in Europe that there are differences in the way China is perceived and the way Russia is perceived? Well, let me first start with uh, the analysis that uh, we do not have one single European stance or European approach to any of these, uh, let's say, uh, key geopolitical players. Uh, there are first and foremost many stakeholders when it comes to foreign policy, security policy in Europe. Europe has a very complex uh, twofold decision making process uh, uh, consisting of, uh, on the one hand, institutions which uh, came up also with uh, their own uh, approach. Uh, that is, in the case of China, the approach of uh, the risking. Now it's about the risking instead of decoupling. When it comes to China, previously it was about signing of a comprehensive agreement on investment, which by the way, if we are to compare with uh, India, uh, is uh, in the hierarchy of uh, uh, trade agreements between the European Commission and uh, uh, third countries uh, lower than uh, FTA, let's say, with a country like India. Uh, 
but then again, of course, um, we have the member states, the countries that are members of the European Union, 27, and we can also argue that here we don't have a clear uh, one, you know, direction approach. When it comes to the big players like uh, Germany, France, we saw that they have, of course, their own national stakes that they have. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, state visits uh, on behalf of the uh, you know, the leadership uh, on both sides, China, but also France and Germany. And uh, then we also, you know, witness some very interesting statements when it comes, for instance, to the uh, engagement of uh, the European powers if, let's say, there would be a military escalation um, linked to Taiwan. Now, uh, coming back to Russia, we saw for a fact that uh, the same uh, was more or less applied um, uh, own uh, European approach to Russia. In fact, I will argue, and most do not understand because they have been not following that so closely, that it was for the most of the years before 2014, 28 to 2014, it was actually Russia's first policy on behalf of the institutions and most of the European states um, in the relation to the so-called Eastern European region. That is the region where Russia is positioned, but also these six states in between, including Ukraine. It was Russia first. What, uh, what did it mean? It, it meant respecting, reflecting on the bilateral relationship between Europe and Russia. There were different baskets. It was about economy. It was about, uh, you know, people to people exchange. It was a lot about, of course, a transfer of, uh, let's say, technology on behalf of Europe. It was a lot about also this idea of uh, creating a dependence, an interdependence based on commodities that would actually enable a relationship in which Russia more or less would be pacified so that there would be zero incentive to make any, let's say, military move on the region or whatsoever. And this Russia first policy felt from the moment when actually Russia made a move on Georgia, later on Ukraine, and in fact uh, the so-called European approach coming out from institutions but also from the very same big powers that are very influential when it comes to also institutional approach, and these are France and Germany, and many forget, by the way, that both France and Germany were in a geopolitical rapprochement with Russia prior to the beginning of the war. Both were in a phase of warming up the relationship with uh, Russia geopolitically, uh, out of the conviction that uh, they need to make sure that there would be no modus vivendi between China and Russia, that Russia would not come to closer, close, uh, closer to, let's say, China. And, um, but and all of this also failed. So Sorry. in a sense, just to wrap it up for, for you, uh, where we are right now, and we are, by the way, not only the Americans, but also we Europeans are, in, I would argue, the probably most critical election cycle. We have uh, elections for the new mm. institutions, that means for the European Parliament, in June this year. So we will have new, you know, new institutions. So the whole institutional approach probably will change to some extent, but we also have elections in various member states. And once again, uh, there are some trends that point to maybe some shift, let's say, in some of, uh, of uh, these policies uh, towards uh, uh, China, but also Russia. So all in all, to sum it up, there are some ideas. Mm -hmm. If you ask me about the idea of the so-called de-risking instead of decoupling, I would argue personally that it is destined to fail in the very same way how the, you know, wander durch Handel, that means trading, uh, uh, you know, uh, as a shift mm -hmm. policy in the relationship with Russia yes. felt actually, and it has been built over the last 20 years. So what we will, uh, you know, what we will observe after this election is probably uh, at least a year of a vacuum until the new, you know, institutions are set up and the new, uh, let's say, faces um, and leaders of, uh, of, of uh, these approaches uh, come up. And in a sense, uh, once again, given the uh, prognosis that the war of Russia against Ukraine is going to continue at least up until Three 2025 years, to 2026. Yeah. You're going to observe more and more bifurcation within Europe because some states, such as those that are closely bordering Russia, and I, I call it the new Iron Curtain, the new cordon sanitaire from Scandinavia, 
Central Eastern European states, Baltics, they will start pursuing also different uh, approach specifically because China has enabled the Russian war in Jin over the last two years. So Russia sustained the war, especially in the first phase when it was facing big difficulties because of China. And I would even go a step further by claiming because I claimed it already in December 2021. Yes, I read that. That Russia will start the war yes. because I was, I was well, part of those who were yes. claiming that there will be a war and that the war will start after February 20. So I would go a step further saying that Russia started the war also because it sided with China before this episode. With so Cold yeah. War 2.0, Dragon Bear on the one side, United States on the other, and for the European powers, it will be increasingly difficult to position in between by not taking sides. Philippe, okay. uh, you will need uh, to. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You've said so many things that you know, I won't, I'll try to sum up. But uh, first of all, I mean, there are also elections coming up in Russia. Uh, you forgot to mention that. On the 17th and, of and, March. All right, okay. And we know who the winner is, so, you know, will be. So uh, the, the fact there are elections in, in Europe, in the European Parliament, is a sign that we have a democracy, which is certainly not the case in Russia, nor in China. That's the first thing. Secondly, um, um, I've been looking at, like Noah, uh, what's happening in, uh, between China and Europe for a number of years. Um, it's not all geopolitical. There are economic reasons, there are economic facts. Uh, there's the notion of level playing field, which is a serious issue. Uh, using the word de-risking uh, is certainly not as strong as decoupling and has some meaning to a, a number of people. And it's a lot about what I was saying earlier, you know, uh, multinationals having difficulties in China, uh, multinationals competing with Chinese multinationals. Arguably, they're not happy about it, uh, including in what the president was saying. Um, but if you look at the past five years, the, uh, the toolbox that the European um, Union has put together is not the one of, of, a, of a dissembled uh, assembly, the way you describe it, with you know, 27 countries that, that, that don't speak in the same voice. It's absolutely not the case. I mean, there's maybe one country that doesn't speak with one voice, that's Hungary. I mean, you know, perhaps... The conservatives. Uh, yeah, there, perhaps right? Hungary should consider leaving the European Union, but I don't think that's what they want to do because they're getting a lot of money out of it. Uh, but Europe has never been as unified on, on geopolitical questions, especially on, on, on the question of China. China? Yeah. Okay, I'm Maybe going to come... Just a clarification, mm -hmm. uh, because I only focus on the geopolitical side of things, and by no means I wanted to actually cover the economic uh, you know, yeah. side. But here, my, my, my base uh, scenario is that uh, when I said it's destined to fail, I only refer to this over-dependence that we are now actually going to further increase in terms of, if you take a look, uh, uh, for instance, at the dependence on rare earths, and we need them for the, not just the, for the sake of energy transition, but also as uh, my colleagues mentioned, for the sake of digital transition. So we have now a big exposure that is very asymmetrical from a geopolitical point of view. You heard it about the pro processing of metals, but it is also about really critical materials where China is not only present in Latin America, it's the same uh, in uh, the African, uh, on the African continent. Yes. And so this is something Somebody that is going to affect the, the European... capacity issue, yeah. which is the reason why China is exporting massively. I and, and, and in a very cheap way sometimes. So yeah, that's so also which is why I want to come uh, to you, sir. Uh, you know, uh, uh, when it comes to Bolivia, it's now using the one to pay, uh, to pay for uh, imports and exports. And it's yet another country in South America which has uh, moved away from the dollar and moved towards the Chinese currency. Uh, how do you see this expanding, this de-dollarization? Uh, I will tell you the same thing about that as the Russian lithium investment is uh, lyrical waxing and promises that have absolutely nothing behind it. Uh, I mean, Russia knows much ab about as much as lithium and EV manufacturing as they know about AI. It's just, it's just announcements that are made. Unfortunately, Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua have regimes in my part of the world that I call um, Sons of Putin. Uh, in Spanish, it's puncher when you translate it. Uh, they're lined up with Russia on their anti, rapidly anti-American. If you just look at the last year, the tour of the foreign minister of Russia, Lavrov, and then Raisi from Iran, where do they go? Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. Venezuela has elections, very important. I have a good friend of mine 
who I hope they don't Navalny her, uh, because she's the last hope standing to have mm -hmm. Venezuela regain a full democracy, Maria Corina Machado. And that's, that, to us in South America, she's more important or as important to us as Zelensky is for Europe. <laughs> and that's what's the most important for us vis-a-vis -vis Russia. So all the, all the announcements about the yuan and we're going to take out the dollar, it's, it's a lot of uh, you know, headline-grabbing announcements. Mm -hmm. But the reality is when Argentina, with a very China-lined-up government previously, was going under, they had to go to the IMF and they had to go to Qatar uh, to get dollars and, and pay the pay the IMF because that's that's not something a government does not decide which is the dominating currency in the in the world, much less one from Latin America. Having said that, let me add, a, so I don't have to uh, speak again, a, a, a couple of quick things. I wanted to make the point about Russia very clearly. I understand uh, it's tough to get India, for example, to take a position that I would like to see vis-a-vis -vis Russia. All friendships uh, have a way of uh, permeating. That's the way the world works. I remember when Mandela, the, the very admired Mandela, died at his funeral, you see lots of people, including Cuba, which is not exactly a democracy, not exactly a beacon of equal rights and human rights, but they uh, gave a hand to the people of Mandela uh, and his people way back when. So old friendships, I understand the power of them and how long <coughs> they last, but I can tell you from the standpoint of South America, I hope Ukraine is able to hold off Russia because without firing a single missile, Russia and Iran have taken a hold of Venezuela. With, and it's a, a haven for Hamas and Hezbollah and a sanctuary for Colombia and uh, remnants of guerrillas, LN and FARC. So I'm all for freeing Ukraine, but we also have to free Venezuela from this nefarious, uh, pernicious influence. On China, the, the last comment I will make. Having recognized the importance of China to South America and two governments recently that would never be qualified as left wing, Lasso in Ecuador, who just left office, signed a free trade agreement with China because the U.S. is not open <clears throat> to sign free trade agreements. Europe, unfortunately, is not either. We have been negotiating a South America with Europe for 25 years. <laughs> uh, the longest dating game without a wedding ring, as, as we say, and we don't have a trade agreement. And China signed one with Ecuador. Uruguay, La Calle is the president, center-right, four generations of center-right politicians with, in, in a family standpoint, and they are queued up to sign a free trade agreement with China. So that's the importance of China for us. Having said that, I'll tell you two weaknesses that China will be facing in our part of the world. One is for the first time ever, at the Paris Club and debt renegotiation tables, they will not be sitting on our side or the African side of the debtor countries that want haircut on the debt, lower interest rates, uh, lower payments, uh, or longer periods of, for repayments. They are on the creditor side. Mm. And they are very reluctant to take haircuts on their debt and ask Bangladesh, ask Sri Lanka, ask African countries. So this China having gone from a developing country to a creditor country and have to do debt renegotiations will put it to the test in terms of its uh, global weight and influence. And on artificial intelligence, from the sheer size of the middle class that they have and their algorithm programming capacity. I, I used to be an IBM systems engineer. I perhaps know more about programming that, uh, or I've forgotten more than, than I will need for the rest of my life. I can tell you, and the world knows, the Chinese algorithm capacity programming is awesome. Mm -hmm. Ask TikTok, ask Facebook. And, and yeah. the power of TikTok, you banned it here, but it's uh, very influential elsewhere. But the restriction of the Chinese firewall when you have the AI and the NVIDIA chips not going to, to China. So they are perhaps not going to be punching at their weight when it comes to this new fourth wave of technology innovation. We went from the PC to the web to the smartphones, and now we are in the midst of the fourth wave. Size matters, but also chip technology matters. And also uh, not having a Chinese firewall on, on digital side also matters. So I think back to where we are. I think that's where India has a great, great opportunity. Arguably, their middle class within the next generation will be as big as China's or Europe's and, and the US's. Uh, you, you have more users, you generate more data, you feed the AI large language models, you have access to NVIDIA chips. So um, if I had to bet long term on whether China or the US-centric system will prevail on AI, I would venture to say that if India gets going, they have a great advantage and a great possibility within the next generation. Because you have the brain yeah. power, you have the engineers, you have the technical know-how, you have the market, you have access to the chips. 
uh, and, and, and you have a you have a, a democracy. It'll take yeah. Uh, it'll take about 10 or 15 years to yeah. play catch up. I'm told. I'm going to uh, you know we the uh, the president just said uh, you know uh, he was talking about old friendships and old relationships and how it's difficult to extricate from them. And just as uh, Valina was also talking about the Russia first policy, it's difficult for countries to pull out once you have that kind of a policy formation. It has a stranglehold over decision making uh, in countries. So. Um, when it comes, you know, India comes in for heat, which I asked even from Velina, uh, from the US and from Europe for its, uh, for its time-tested relationship with Russia. And I'll quote the Indian Foreign Minister yet again, who said that India's relations with Europe, US and China um, have, uh, they've, they've seen the test of time and they've been ups and downs. And then he went on to say Russia has never hurt our interests. And then he said uh, that we, on the other hand, have had a politically and mili militarily much more difficult relationship with China. Do you see Europe and uh, Europe not as one entity because they, had, they have different views, but do you see US and uh, some countries in Europe uh, coming to terms with the fact that each one of us in Asia have a complex, complicated, and difficult relationship with China. We all have a different relationship with China. <laughs> uh, I, I, I live in Germany. Germany has developed a very close economic relationship with China. It's the biggest economy in Europe. Uh, and there's a, a very intense discussion going on in Germany right now about dependencies, uh, about uh, de-risking, uh, German companies have invested tens of billions of euros in, uh, in China uh, and some of them continue uh, to invest because the Chinese market has become much more competitive. Jorge talked about uh, electric vehicles. Germany has yep. been a dominant player in cars for, for many years. You know the, the brands BMW, Mercedes, Volkswagen. Um, these companies are inc increasingly under pressure in the Chinese market now. Uh, we've seen a shift from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, Germany uh, is, is behind China, China is ahead. Uh, but it's important to note that the reason, some of the reasons that China is ahead, subsidies, yeah. uh, selective market access to, to, to foreigners, protecting their own industries. Um, so uh, this is the big debate in Europe right now. Philippe touched on this, uh, overcapacity, uh, the risk that uh, floods of uh, uh, Chinese electric vehicles come into the European market. About a dozen years ago, we had a debate in Europe about solar, uh, that uh, cheap, uh, uh, solar panels uh, mm -hmm. from China were coming in uh, and and the, the European and the German solar industry went uh, essentially went under um, cars is different I would say and uh, Germany and Europe cars will, as in battery cars yes cars in mm -hmm. general the auto industry yes. okay. um, I, this is a this is an industry that Germany has has, has played a dominant role in. France is also a player. Italy is also a player. Uh, and the European Commission launched in, in October uh, an anti-subsidy investigation into imports of uh, electric vehicles from China. Mm -hmm. I was in Brussels last week and people are very worried in the Commission about not just an influx of Chinese electric vehicles but also other, other products including solar panels. Um, so we're going to have uh, an increasingly tense uh, trade relationship between the EU and, uh, and China over the course of this year. The EU will be taking a number of measures that uh, Philippe talked about, the defensive toolbox that the EU has developed over recent years. Um, how will e EU relations with China develop going forward? I think it will be interesting to see uh, what comes out of the U.S. election, that's going to have a big impact. Um, I think it could force the EU to become perhaps a bit more risk averse, a bit more cautious with China. I don't think the EU wants a major trade conflict with both China and the U.S. Um, 
but I, I do think that um, I do think that we've been on a one-way street for the better part of five years uh, between the EU and China, uh, and I don't think EU policy on China is going to change to a significant extent uh, unless. China's behavior and China's policies change, and it doesn't look like we're heading in that direction. Uh, Xi Jinping has been in power now uh, for over over a decade, uh, and could be in power for for much longer. And he has yeah. been focused very much on security, right? Uh, so I'll take the concluding remark from you. Um, I'm uh, Philippe. I wanted to ask you because uh, you know what we were talking about Europe and China uh, at the Munich Security Conference. It was quite clear that China wants to draw Europe closer to itself. Um, and it was like uh, trying to portray itself as a more reliable partner to Europe. Um, and uh, rather than, uh, say, America, especially when it came to say that the budget was not being cleared, because there was a lot of talk there that uh, America is not clearing the budget for uh, Ukraine. So, you know, um, Minister uh, Wang Yi said, and I'm quoting him, uh, it's imperative that China and Europe stay clear of geopolitical and ideological distraction. I like the term he uses. And see each other as partners rather than as rivals. So it's very clear that rivals is when China sees them as rivals, mm -hmm. but partners when China sees you as a partner. Right. How, does, how does Europe That's react to that? That's a good way to, to put it. Uh, it's like China is all often uh, accusing others to politicizing things when the Communist Party of China is actually the most political entity you can find anywhere in the world. Um, so, yeah, I mean, China is presenting itself as a stabilizing force uh, in, in the international uh, arena. That's the new uh, concept. And, and, and for that matter, uh, it sees America as the competitor, while it sees Europe as a partner. Uh, first, because it has a big market, I think that's what we've been talking about, and in EVs or all kinds of things, um, and rare earth and all the things that China wants to export because sometimes it's the, the sole producer of those. Um, at the same time, it doesn't want Europe to play geopolitics, and, um, and it doesn't respond to Europe's uh, query about, um, you know, the, the Russia situation and the Russia-Ukraine uh, situation. So, I, you, know, I, you know, I think it takes two to tango. Uh, at the moment, I would agree that it's not the right moment for a, a great friendship. Uh, people are sort of waiting for the end of the year. Um, U.S. elections, other things, European elections, and also countries. what the Chinese uh, leadership yeah. will do. I mean, you haven't mentioned, nobody has mentioned the word Taiwan, yeah. but it does affect mm. the domestic situation in China, and, and China wants to be an economic superpower. But if there is a conflict in Taiwan, if there is a conflict in the South China Sea, I mean, you know, the Chinese consumers are not going to go back to the supermarkets, I can tell yeah. you that. And, and therefore, uh, China's ambitions to become a great leader might be uh, impeded by this. That's another uh, a war theater that everybody is watching out from, a possible right. war theater, which is uh, Taiwan. Uh, so I'm going to ask you, Valina, about that. Is Taiwan watching with nervousness uh, about how the rest of the world is reacting to this? And will the, the, will the fact that 60 plus countries going in for elections, America going in specially for election, uh, everybody distracted, is that an ideal time for any kind of uh, proactive measure by China to take over Taiwan? Maybe not militarily, but in some form, they'd like it to be non-military. Uh, without a, without blood spilled, a quick war if possible, but there is nothing like that, right? There's nothing called a quick war anymore. Exactly. You saw what happened with the Ukraine. one week uh, war by Russia against Ukraine, and uh, I argue I'm not convinced that uh, China will see any incentive in uh, militarily attacking Taiwan uh, unless there is a serious political situation at home under which uh, uh, Chairman Xi Jinping will would see uh, himself uh, under pressure to act, uh, so some sort of black swan event. In fact, I argue that what we may see is a little bit of a Soviet playbook uh, here. Uh, what I call, you know, a death by thousand cuts, a slow but uh, steady penetration of the vibrant ec economic model. Uh, Taiwan is the most uh, successful democrat, you know, um, 
democratic uh, state with the most vibrant, uh, one of the most vibrant economies in the region. So a slow penetration of the political system with uh, all, you know, the playbook of, uh, of active measures that you can do on an open society, you can do on a, on a um, let's say, a dem democratic system because we democratic systems are like uh, you know, open box of chocolates, you can pick, you can move pieces, you can do whatever you like without uh, being noticed. And then, of course, the social, the social construct, you can uh, provoke from inside with slow cuts, which the system can, will not identify. And by doing so, you know, you will have uh, at some point of time in the future a situation where you can move, uh, you, you, can, you can make the next move on Taiwan, something similar what happened to Hong Kong, if you remember how you know, everybody was outraged and then everybody, you know, was uh, somehow hoping that there would be a the change. The umbrella revolution. And, and now we all moved on, right? <laughs> yes, correct. So, but what I also see... But it can't happen. In jail. Yeah. All the dissidents are in jail, so, you so know, it's that's why I or, say or that, in exile. That's why I think but, that from yeah. a geopolitical perspective, <laughs> and I'm really only focusing on the geopolitical perspective here, yeah. I'm not giving any normative uh, judgment what is right or what is Can't wrong. Yeah, uh, um, right. I think that uh, for, from, uh, from Chinese perspective, this is uh, uh, connected to less risks. And uh, uh, in the case of Taiwan, there are many more military risks than what we saw with Russia's war against Ukraine. You have a certain window of opportunity to, let's say, militarily attack Taiwan. You cannot do it the whole year. Then it is a very different uh, geographic location from There's what we saw. Yeah. Yeah, so typhoons. all in all, I see little to no um, actually prospect for that. But what I see for this year, for 2024, is that Russia and China together, because again, I am not convinced that most of the, let's say, expert community really understands the systems analysis of this, that these two actors are already um, operating on the ground. We saw many examples uh, in uh, uh, South America. Same goes for uh, some cases of Europe, same goes for uh, Asia, same goes for Africa. So what I'm trying to say is that they will uh, activate the North Korean card uh, North Korea is now a big supplier for Russia in terms of uh, ammunition uh, and Russia is supplying, um, you know, rocket uh, technology, satellites and so on. So they will activate the North uh, Korean card and at the same time we will see military tensions below the threshold of a kinetic warfare with neighbors of China in South China Sea and obviously in the Strait of Taiwan. And this is going to be a really serious escalation episode for the Biden administration ahead of the uh, presidential election, election, where United States are already overstretched, not with one, not with two, but actually with three hotspots because we have also an ongoing Israel crisis. Must. We West have Asia. ongoing crisis in the Red Sea, where the only ships and tankers that are the actually Hortons. able to move freely are the Chinese ships. You know, you need only Chinese uh, crew flag on your ship, and you have the Russian, you know, uh, shadow fleet uh, operating on the ground, where the Americans and the British, and now with the European Union operation uh, start, uh, that started just a week ago, we have a serious difficulty, you know, to enable the freedom of operation in one of the most critical choke points that actually enables 70% um, of the trade that is conducted on this maritime route coming from Europe to Asia. So you have this hotspot, hot spot, you have an ongoing war in uh, Ukraine that is going to continue and will have a next serious escalation phase uh, following the election on the 17th of March uh, in Russia and you have the ongoing, uh, you know, Middle East um, um, conflict. So in a sense, it is becoming uh, broader. We have more hotspots, but all of it, uh, as I said, without a serious incentive on behalf of the United States or China and Russia to, to get involved yeah. in a direct military clash or let's say a uh, nuclear exchange because this whole narrative of World War III where you see uh, an incentive to have a nuclear exchange uh, or uh, any kind of direct uh, war, I think that this is uh, not really serious uh, assessment. But, but then again, you have more escalation and this is not good, yeah. of course, for markets and for the economic outlook for both developed and developing countries. So I have very little time. So just quick. No, I would just say that, yes. that my, my sense is that China 
China is in stabilization mode this mm -hmm. year. The biggest concern in Beijing right now is the state of the economy, luring foreign investors, uh, retaining access to markets like Europe. Uh, and, and so I don't think China will, my, my sense is that China is not going to be tempted to... Taiwan. Uh, uh, mm. Well, certainly not Taiwan this year, but, but um, we'll be keeping, trying to keep the tensions low. There's a lot of uncertainty, of course, associated with the U.S. election. Uh, so my sense is that this is going to be a bit of com a, a calmer year. I think the bigger risks are after the election, if you have a, a second Trump term, Trump has said, that that's the unknown factor. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> unknown. Yes and no. I mean, it was there before. But I would yeah. just add one thing about, uh, about the Suez Canal. Uh, never forget that China is a prime investor in the Suez Canal. I don't think they will, they will wait for another two years before uh, you know, the, 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 the trouble stop in this, in this region. I mean, economically, remember, they are the first trading nation in the world. Yes. And, cool. and there are things like that. You know, mm -hmm. the Chinese economy is in trouble. And you know it's all very nice having these this, uh, this, uh, this, this ships with uh, Chinese flags passing by, uh, but some of them may have mixed capitals. And, and secondly, the, 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 the Egyptians are, are very worried. You know, yes. this is this is a right key so. uh, element mm. of the of their economy. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, thank and thank you, Valina, for being part of this. Hopefully, when we collect next year for the Raisina 2025, we'll talk about less hot spots and a safer place. Uh, in the world, right? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you for watching or listening to this edition of the ANI podcast with Smita Prakash. Do like or subscribe on whichever channel you have seen this or heard this. Namaste. Jai Hind. Click here to watch the previous episodes.